So good afternoon and welcome to this webinar celebrating International Women's Day. I'm Beth Turner, Head of Learning and Development for Robert Half in the UK. As I prepared for this webinar, I saw the progress that's been made within businesses with regard to equality, and I wondered if we still needed to recognise International Women's Day. I spoke with our highly successful panellists, I spoke with influential female colleagues, I thought of my own career and I spoke with male leaders who are committed to achieving gender parity. Over the last 10 years in particular, many organisations have been working hard to close the gap and give women the same opportunities as men. For example, quoting from Hampton Alexander Research, in 2011, only 9.5% of FTSE 350 companies had female board members. That number is now up to 34%. And this progress wasn't based on legislation. It was voluntary action by these organisations. So men and women are seeing the benefit of a more gender diverse working environment. But then you look beneath the surface. Yes, on the one hand, there are 34% of companies with female board members, but only 17 women are CEOs, less than 5%. Why is that? I learned from listening to Helen Pankhurst that there isn't a set maternity leave policy for all politicians. They have to argue their case to get it. Why is that? Women make up 51% of the population, but only 23% of the cabinet. Why is that? If businesses, policy and structures are predominantly led by men, what impact does that have on women? So I concluded that it's important to recognize the progress and cultural changes that have been made but it's also really important to continue to have a focus on gender parity and to have conversations like we're going to have today. So the format for the next hour is to introduce our panellists who come from the world of senior finance holding CFO and director roles. I'll ask them some questions, we will have some polls and also hopefully have an opportunity for questions um, from you in the Q&A and we look forward to your contribution. So I'll pass over first of all to introduce yourself to Julia. Hello and hi everyone, thanks for having me Beth. Um, so just give a quick introduction, so my name is Julia Lewis, I'm a director at EY uh, in our business consulting practice and I've been there for the last sort of two years. Uh, I started my career out in finance actually, I've got a SEMA qualification, had a couple of roles in FP&A, uh, first of all at Xerox, then uh, Anderson Consulting as it was back then. Um, and then I sort of spent uh, seven years at a company called Tetra Pak, uh, based up in the northwest, who were setting up a finance shared service centre and uh, had a, a, a good time there before sort of stepping away. Well, I say it's stepping away into the interim market, I had seven years as an interim. And then finally, after my fourth child, I'm a working mother of four, um, I joined EY a couple of years ago. So hi, everyone. Great. Thank you, Julia. And over to you, Lisa. Thanks, Beth. So uh, good afternoon, everybody. Uh, my name is Lisa Roxnard. I'm currently the CFO uh, for Europe at Geldwin. Uh, I've been in industry or, or actually in manufacturing now for just over 20 years. Um, so uh, predominantly within finance, but also in some broader roles and uh, within uh, kind of within the business, but also within services being provided as well. And uh, I actually joined Geldwin early uh, or Q1 2020, and my first day was just as we'd closed the offices. So I joined the company during kind of the first wave of the, the pandemic and have been essentially working remotely since. So uh, that's had some challenges, but it's uh, it's all been good. So uh, I'm looking forward to, to getting back into the office or even getting into the office for the first time. Great. Thanks, Lisa. And Erica. Hi, I'm Erica. Um, I'm CFO of NCC Software Resilience Group. Um, and I'm also a SEMA accountant. Um, I've had quite an unusual career for a SEMA accountant, started off training with MS and then sort of danced between various large uh, media PLCs and private equity, and then had a, a spell of setting up my own business as well, and then and then selling that. Um, so uh, quite a variety of places, really. Uh, I joined NCC in December. Um, I'm yet to actually physically meet my colleagues, um, but I'm certainly have, having a good time working virtually with them. 
Great. Okay, thank you all. So a warm welcome to you and uh, thank you very much for taking the time to contribute to the conversation today. So also here we have uh, Matt Robinson in the background who's producing the webinar and he'll also be running the polls and um, we're hoping to have Q&A towards the end. So hello, Matt. So to start with, I think a lot of people would be interested to hear about um, your career journeys. So the first question is, what have been some of your biggest career triumphs and challenges? So for me, in terms of my uh, kind of career triumphs, um, I've had the opportunity to work with a lot of large uh, organisations. So I've spent uh, kind of most of my tenure either with Siemens or Thermo Fisher Scientific or an Eaton. It's a very large organisations which gave me the opportunity to get quite a broad view um, of organisations and being able to work within different functions along the way. So for me, I spent time in, uh, in product management, within uh, M&A, within process improvement, business integration, so lots of uh, different areas that stepped me outside of finance for a period. And for me to have that kind of all-rounded uh, kind of business partner relationship and being able to bring more to the, uh, the party than just the numbers, um, for me is where I feel that my career has triumphed um, from having those challenges. Um, does bring challenge. Um, it is, I was very mindful of not just drifting into other roles. Uh, I was quite purposeful about which roles I wanted to take outside of, outside the finance remit, purely because uh, I trusted my mentors and my, and my leaders that it was a good role that I was moving to, but equally, what did I want to personally grow and get out of, of that role? So I was very um, cognizant of which role and why I, was, I, I wanted to move to for what I personally wanted to, to achieve. So it was a challenge of finding that balance between trying to do everything or wanting to do everything versus being a bit more intentional. Great, okay, I like that. Uh, which role and why, I think. Yeah, it's probably quite easy to float into a role. So um, that's good. Great, thank you. So I like this question. What advice, this is back to you, Lisa. So what advice would you give to your younger self? Um, so for me, uh, I would always uh, have, uh, always be open to the possibility of still needing to learn. Um, I actually had uh, one of my, my HR colleagues a few years ago, uh, maybe five, 10 years ago now, always feels like a few years ago. And, uh, and, and when we was doing uh, kind of just some feedback sessions, um, she would send the invite and the invite would say uh, the location being Lisa Island. And uh, so that became a bit of a, a running joke, but it really started to teach me that actually, um, even though I've got all of my kind of technical skill sets, there were still lots of things that I still needed to learn and wanted to learn around kind of my, my people skills and the management style and uh, just having that on Lisa Island and letting people onto Lisa Island um, just helped me start to recognize that um, I had become um, quite introverted uh, in some respects and quite direct in times because that's what the business kind of necessitated. No, necess I can't say the word. Uh, try again like, that's what was yeah. <laughs> that was what was uh, needed during the time it was quite cyclical uh, and we needed to do some restructuring for instance and that came with that came with some challenges so for me it was to learn to be more open um so for if i'd have maybe been more cognizant of that coming through my more junior career um and and that i don't know all the answers even today I don't know all the answers and I'm still learning uh, kind of 21 years into manufacturing and very much still learning, but being open mm -hmm. to that and just trusting uh, my judgment and being inquisitive, which I've done in roles, but then maybe stretch myself more on that kind of management side. Great. Okay. Thank you. And um, this question also to Julia. Um, so first of all, I totally echo what, what Lisa's saying there about learning and, and grabbing every, every opportunity. I think probably two others that I would say. The first one is around confidence. Um, so be confident and 
you know, we all have these voices in our head that might be saying, oh, you're not very good at sport or, oh, you definitely can't sell, um, you know, that, that are sort of negatively teaching us not to grab things and, and take opportunities. And I think that self-awareness around what we're saying to ourselves versus what everyone else is saying to us, we, we need to figure out, you know, and find our confidence. Um, and I think probably the second thing is around your sort of core values and a lot of these training courses and personality things will help you figure out what your core values are. And I think as you go through your career, stay true to what those core values are. Uh, we've all got different ones. And, you know, if something doesn't feel right, then it probably isn't. So, uh, yeah, you know, go with your intuition. Great. Thank you. And I think if you, um, you know, if you want, you want to give 110% to a job and if they don't match your core value, the role doesn't match your core values, that's not possible, is it? So. No, definitely. Great. Okay. So moving on then um, to our first poll, Matt, if you could uh, launch that. So this poll is for now everybody to get involved. Um, so the question is, do you believe that there's been a lot of this in the press about this in the press, but do you believe that COVID-19 has disproportionately impacted women? So if you could vote, please. Um, and then as Matt gets the votes in, he'll let us know when the poll's ready and um, you'll see the results and we'll all see the results. Yeah, we've got most people have voted now, Beth, so I'll just give it another probably 10 seconds and I'll close Great. the poll for you. Thank you, Matt. So I'm going to close the poll now and you should now be able to see the results, Beth. Okay, so um, the overwhelmingly yes. Um, I've been reading quite a lot about this and I think women were more likely to be made uh, redundant. I think they took on 79% of women said they took on more of the childcare. So I think there were lots of ways that it, it did impact them. So um, any of the panelists want to comment on that? I know Erica, we're coming into the question, which is about this. So we might lead into that, but if you want to you know, have the poll in mind. So the question that we're asking you, Erica, is has COVID-19 disproportionately impacted women? Um, and what are some of the ways you've experienced this or seen it within your teams? Yeah, I mean, I think there's been many horrific consequences of COVID, but uh, one of the, again, another sad aspect of it is that it's taken women back, I think, a significant step uh, from where we were going. I think when you look at the stats, a lot of women work part time um, and, and they've been a lot of the people who've suffered and, and been made redundant. I think when people have been uh, working out who to keep sometimes, you know, it seems like the, the part time workers have been uh, casualties of that. And this is uh, a lot of this is anecdotal from speaking to a lot of my friends who are women in business. Fortunately, my business um, has not made any redundancies and, and uh, hopefully we have been flexible to women. But I know a lot of senior women who have been really struggling, particularly on the childcare side. And that applies, I think, to anyone who has main childcare responsibilities, particularly as a single mother myself. I think a, any single person has been affected by COVID in a really particularly detrimental way. And women particularly, because women do still bear most of the burden of schoolwork. Um, you know, homeschooling has been particularly difficult, particularly with young children as well. And, and, I, and I think a lot of people have been exhausted by the whole thing. And I suppose if we're looking at, you know, whether people want to apply for jobs at that particular moment in their career, there may be many women who just didn't have the energy, quite frankly, uh, to, to go and look for a new opportunity. So I think it's affected women in that disproportionate women have, have lost their jobs. It's affected women's, I think, uh, you know, mental health and health in general, trying to juggle so many balls in the air. And it's probably affected career progression as well in terms of limiting people's willingness to apply for new positions too. Yeah, that's a, that's a really good point. I hadn't thought of that, that knock on from, uh, yeah, just like drained. Um, and that's not the best time to apply. That's a really good point. Yeah, okay. and I'm, I'm, I've got plenty of friends who, are, you know, are talking about coming home, kids to look after, trying to homeschool while dealing with client meetings, you know, with young children, 
husband's gone to work, you know, really, really struggling just to keep on top of things. So, you know, it, I, I, you know, it's, I think the struggle is real on that one. Yeah. Okay. Thank you, Erica. So uh, Julia, you're also um, answering this one. Yeah. So, I mean, so obviously I've got four children. So, um, and I think looking back, you know, from a personal perspective, that first lockdown was pretty horrific um, when we really were 100% locked down. And I sort of tell the story about, and it was literally midday of day one where my husband and I had a most amazing row as to whose career was the most important and whose client meeting took precedence. And, you know, he literally was like, I'm going to work. And I'm like, you can't because <laughs> we're in lockdown. Um, and I think it's just a classic um, scenario that's played out, I think, across the UK. I mean, Fortunately for me, uh, you know, I do have help. So once we were allowed help in, that that has really, um, you know, I, I've managed to, to cope through it. But I, I can't imagine if I didn't have help how I would have got through it. Uh, you know, and I think that is that is a sad testament that, yeah, definitely women have been um, adversely affected. I mean, I think that there is a couple of points though in terms of what we can do. And, you know, the point of my husband, for example, is, you know, there's a case where he'll say, okay, well, I'll make the dinner. And I think, well, actually, you don't know how to cook. So that means we're having what we call chicken ding, you know, it goes in the microwave and and, and that's your dinner. And, and he said, well, you know, if you want me to cook, I will do that. So it's it's a case of sometimes being a little bit less controlling at home and taking those, you know, not having to do everything. Um, you know, you've got to be a bit less controlling. And I think the other sort of positive that I would take from it is through the last sort of 12 months, you know, working at EY, I've probably seen as many men with children on their laps and babies on their laps and having to go off camera because there's a toddler come in as I have women, um, you know, or dogs or cats coming and licking them. Um, so I think that's been quite encouraging that there does seem to be becoming, you know, more of a balance where, where, where there's two people there to, to take on that responsibility as well. Yeah. That's a good a good point, actually, at the end, you know, at the, the positive aspect of it, because, yes, we've probably never seen the men with their children no. before. Or even so. talking about children. No, no, exactly. <laughs> it's all yeah. been, they've fully been brought in and it's been accepted. So yeah. that might, might see a shift in that way. So great. OK, so on to the fourth question. Um, this is about, um, you know, we've all experienced this shift to remote work and um, the greater need for flexibility, more reliance on technology to keep us connected. So some of these changes will be here to stay. Um, so the question to you, Erica, how do you think the future of work will impact women? Yeah, so I, I think this is quite interesting with COVID. So we've discussed all the terrible things that it's doing for women, but actually I think there will be some good points that come out of this. And, uh, you know, I've been working flexibly for a very long time. Um, you know, when my daughter was six months and she's 14 now, um, I was working flexibly. And I remember back in the day, if you worked from home, people thought that you were in your pyjamas all day and, and you know, <laughs> putting loads of washing in. And I remember very clearly having a big budget presentation to do to the director general of the BBC and being quite nervous about it because I was at home and I was trying to remove all sort of traces of anything to do with family life from the background and got my mum to sort of keep my children downstairs whilst, uh, whilst I did this presentation because back in the day, you know, if you were a woman in a senior role, you had to pretend you didn't have kids and you didn't have a life outside work. It was really quite a different attitude and quite a tragic one. And um, despite my best efforts, my son burst into the middle of a budget presentation and announced to everyone that he'd done a massive poo, which um, was a bit of a career defining moment and, and a standing joke for everybody that I came across uh, ever since, you know, uh, and, and, and I think these days, uh, having gone through this, people understand that people have family lives and, you know, kids will appear and dogs will, you know, go, go crazy at postman and, and, you know, it's just a little bit more human, I think, and that slightly more human aspect will really help women 
particularly the flexible working side of it. Many offices won't go back to work um, full time. And so that will really help women around school pick up times and being close to home so that they can do the same, you know, um, the, the same hours work a day, but without the two hour commute, which means that they can get back in time to collect children and, 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 and supervise homework and stuff rather than sitting on the Mancunian way. And, and I think things like that will make a massive difference and will bring us forward, you know, and, and a sort of supercharged flexible working really. Um, from from where it was going in the first place pre-COVID. Yeah, I think that, um, as you're saying, that uh, pretense you've got to put up if you're trying to pretend that something else is going on and you're not at home, it, it's it's such an added layer of pressure that you don't need. Um, so yeah, that could be a really good thing. Um, and this question's also going to you, Julia. Yeah, so so I think uh, just to build on what, what Eric has been saying there in terms about, you know, the flexible working, the remote working um, and, you know, from some of the studies that we've been doing at EY around this, we absolutely think that, you know, this is going to be here to stay. Um, you know, I, I think what we're anticipating is what we're calling a hybrid model. So, you know, you go to almost like a 50-50, so two days in the office, two days at home, um, which will absolutely have a phenomenal impact, uh, I think, on, on, on women working. I think one of the other factors um, that we, we, we talk about when we talk about the future of work is actually working longer so and having multiple career paths so this idea that negatively we can't retire as early <laughs> positively that means we can fit more exciting stuff into our career paths and I think that's sort of comforting for a woman as well because if I look at my career and I you know I have that little period in the middle where I had kids and I sort of was stepping back a bit and not pushing myself forward if I look at the age that I will eventually promote to partner, I'm going to be older than my male counterparts because of that gap, if you like, in my career where I've sort of held myself back. But actually, I'm probably going to be around for longer than they are. And it means that, you know, I can have multiple careers, you know, so whether that's having time out to look after kids, we've got time to fit it all in. So, so I think that change in terms of demographic is actually going to also be a positive thing for us as well. Yeah. Great, thank you, Julia. I love that positive spin on the fact that we're all working for a long, long time. <laughs> <laughs> um, okay, so we're on to the next question, which is um, around uh, the biases. So choose to challenge is this year's um, International Women's Day theme. And, um, and it's, you know, it's a reminder that we've got a role to play with regard to initiating change and being sort of, you know, I, I talked initially about some of the, you know, the, the huge uh, sort of the huge hurdles we've got to get to, but it's sometimes the smaller things that can make a difference. So I'm really interested to see, um, and I'm coming to you first, Lisa, what's an assumption or a stereotype um, or bias related to gender that you've witnessed? And how did you handle that experience? Because I think many people will um, will experience these things and wonder you know, what's the best way, what's the best way to go about it? So, Lisa. Thanks, Beth. Um, so in terms of my experience, um, it's actually a personal experience uh, that I had around about 12 years ago, uh, I think it was. Uh, so not long after I'd got married, I was actually interviewing for a, for a new position at a different company, uh, a company that I really wanted to, to work for, uh, still within manufacturing. Um, but, uh, but I was interviewing and it was a one-to-one -one interview, so just me and the interviewer in the room. Interview was, had gone well, uh, but at the end of that, the interviewer actually asked me, so now that you're married, are you planning on having children or planning, a, planning to have a family? Um, so uh, I, I didn't think anything of it, responded uh, with the absolute honest answer that I don't plan on having children. Um, however, then the response back to me was, oh, that will probably change. You'll change your mind and that's going to be a bit of a risk. And at the time, uh, and it kicks me in hindsight now, um, I should have absolutely have challenged that. Um, I didn't actually obviously want to go and work for this company uh, anymore, unfortunately, and just because of this one experience. But 
with the hindsight and uh, I suppose more of the confidence and the working knowledge uh, that I have now, I absolutely should have challenged it on the basis of that person did not know if I could physically have children. They didn't know uh, what my personal circumstances were at home that my husband might be um, the primary carer and it wouldn't have actually have affected uh, their perception of, of risk in that sense. Uh, equally, um, they, uh, they assumed you had to, because I've got married, that I was going to have children. Well, many people have children that are not married. So therefore, so there's kind of lots of bias um, within there, which absolutely I kick myself now that I didn't, uh, I didn't react uh, with, uh, <laughs> with a bit more uh, rigor, I think. Um, yeah. and, and so one thing that I uh, try to, to work with my teams particularly on and, and when they're looking at whether it's CVs or looking at uh, interviewing is, is kind of making sure that they don't come to reviewing CVs, for instance, with uh, kind of a bias. So often you'll get a resume through that has, uh, maybe it's got some kind of gaps in terms of the time between roles. And sometimes that can be seen as a as negative, uh, even when you're reading the CV. And for me, well, actually, there could be a number of reasons why people have gaps within their roles could be because they have had uh, leave to, to bring up a family, could be that they were uh, uh, caring for uh, an elderly relative or, or parents during that time, or they could have had health issues themselves. So I think sometimes there's, a, 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 I suppose, an unconscious bias that starts to, uh, to, uh, to come in when people are kind of just, like say, reviewing CVs or if somebody's had uh, many moves within, um, within uh, companies, maybe they just haven't found that place that they could be their true self at. They just haven't found the right company for them yet. And equally, um, if you think about those that have got long tenure, so I actually interviewed um, someone and we, uh, we've offered the role, but uh, a few weeks ago where uh, they've had 15 years tenure at a company, and uh, as part of that, I was like, well, great. What they've obviously learned that they've felt such a belonging in that company. And it's only through redundancy now that they're, they're actually leaving, but something has kept them at that company. There must be something that we can harness on that feeling of, of how, how, they, how they felt that uh, kind of being at home with that company for that length of tenure. Um, so I just think there's lots of things to learn and not necessarily uh, kind of take the CV as it's, as it's naturally kind of written and, and be inquisitive. Great. Thank you, Lisa. That's great. And um, the same question to you, Erica. Um, so, so I applied for a job uh, a while back and, uh, and, it, and it went quite well um, with a recruitment consultant. And at the end, they said to me, and, um, and what does your husband do? Um, and I was quite floored, actually, because I, I've not really come across such kind of overt uh, questioning. And I said, um, oh, um, do you know something that I don't? Because I don't actually have a husband. And then he <laughs> said, well, you must you must have a boyfriend. So what does your boyfriend do? And, uh, and I just, I, I thought there's so many things wrong with this question, <laughs> right? Uh, they're assuming I've got a husband. I mean, then they're assuming I've got a boyfriend. I mean, there's so, so many things wrong with it from, from, from uh, in so many ways. Um, and, and I was quite floored and I, I just looked at them and I said, I said, I'm really happy to answer that question, but first, can you just tell me why that, that makes a difference to my ability to do the role? And he said, well, uh, have you got children? And I said, I do have children. And he said, how will you cope? You know, with the, you know, this could be a role that, that demands quite long hours. How will you cope with the long hours? And I said, well, you know, I have been running the finances of a 300 million pound business. So I'd like to think I've factored in the fact that I've got children to feed and look after as well. Um, and, and then we, sw we swiftly moved on. Um, and I spoke to a few male, I spoke to a few female colleges, uh, colleagues about this. I was raging. Um, and they all agreed that it was a very stupid question. And I spoke to a few uh, male friends who, who work in business and they were like, what's wrong with that question? It's just a nice question. <laughs> Why are you so uptight about it? Um, and I think that there is, you know, there's a lot of people out there who just don't realize their own unconscious biases. And I think it's really important to call that out. And in calling it out, we don't have to do it in a, you know, a dramatic way, but we can still make our point. And I do mm. think that 
you know, as more senior women in business, we have almost a moral obligation to call out things like this and make people more aware of other people's circumstances and how things can be perceived. Um, and so, so I do think that's pretty important. And so I'm, I'm quite interested in the concept of unconscious bias, unconscious mm -hmm. bias amongst people. If anyone's recruiting someone and they maybe didn't think that that candidate's quite right, I will quiz them on why to make sure that there's no unconscious bias coming into it. And, and, and so I think, I think that's an important thing for us all, all to bear in mind. Yeah, and I, that's really, I mean, unbelievable questioning, really, isn't it? That uh, that they can uh, still be asking things like that. So, but yeah, that uh, unconscious bias creeps in, uh, creeps in everywhere. So it's um, important to be aware of. Um, okay, thank you, Erica. Now we're going to launch our second uh, poll now. So Matt, if you can bring that up. So this one is, what do you believe is the biggest challenge for women and men to overcome as we move towards gender parity in 2021? Um, so really it's what's the biggest challenge for men and women to overcome in 2021 as we move towards gender parity? I can't guarantee we're gonna get gender parity by the end of the year. So economic inequality, lack of women in positions of power, navigating career, et cetera. I want to give a bit more time to vote, Beth, because I think there's, you know, um, there's more options on the screen, obviously, and probably people want a bit more time to think on this one. So we've got a, quite okay. a few votes that have come in, but I'll leave it open for about another 15, uh, 20 seconds. Okay, thank you. We possibly need an all of an all of the above uh, <laughs> box on that one, I think. Yeah. That's true. <laughs> I keep trying to select it, but I'm not allowed. <laughs> <laughs> I should have, I, yeah, I should have opened it to panelists as well. Sorry about that. I didn't do that. Um, okay, so give it about another couple of seconds. I'm going to end the poll now, and Beth, I'm just going to share the results with you. You should see that now. Okay. Oh, interesting. Gender oh, interesting. stereotypes and bias as uh, as the highest as the highest one. Um, any any thoughts on that from our panelists julia you were desperately trying to vote <laughs> well i was thinking it would be the second one uh, lack of women in positions of power yeah. but, but um i would you know gender stereotypes is probably the second biggest uh, in my view but yeah no that's interesting yeah anyone else want to comment no okay i would i would have thought i'm thinking of um like say the things i've read just about how few people there are at those um, top spots. I, I would have agreed. I would have thought that would have been higher, but um, maybe that's what people are experiencing. And mm. perhaps we've got a lot of people who are feeling they're being held back by those stereotypes. So I almost want the next section. I want a comment section, but uh, maybe, maybe some of that, maybe, you know, we're going to have a Q and a um, towards the end. So perhaps if there's anyone who did vote for those stereotypes and bias, you could um, ask a further question on that. So the next question is, um, if this is one for you all and it's about allyship. Um, and I think a reminder that uh, achieving gender parity is not about a conflict between men and women. And I hope any men on the call don't feel that. Um, many men support gender parity and in some cases, some women you know, don't. And it's a team game and not everyone's on the team you think there will be. So it's uh, certainly not a conflict between men and women. But what? Um, but what's the best way to be a champion or ally for gender equality? So um, if we go to you first, Lisa. Oh, yeah. Yeah. Go to you first, Lisa. Yeah. Yeah. Um, so so for me, uh, it's absolutely kind of key that I continually kind of demonstrate and role model um, what uh, kind of I, what I expect and what I would like my team uh, to also be kind of thinking about. So we've talked about kind of the bias and, and kind of the interviews and CVs, um, but the, the benefit of having um, kind of the, the, the breadth and the, the, the perspective of all those different opinions um, within a team. So having, uh, whether it's uh, kind of, racial or, or, or kind of gender, uh, that breadth that it brings is absolutely key. 
And so for me to, whilst I'm continually kind of demonstrating and role modeling and, and trying to um, kind of, I don't want to stamp out those biases, uh, but equally I need to be an active contributor. I can't just kind of sit on the sidelines and let things happen around me. Um, I want to kind of bring my uh, perspective and, and bring uh, kind of my opinion to the table. And uh, if, I, if I hear something that doesn't quite sit right with me or something I want to challenge, it's about effectively challenging that. And I think Erica uh, kind of spoke to it around, you don't need to make a big deal out of it. Uh, I actually uh, had the uh, example uh, in, a, in a previous company um, where, for instance, uh, there was a meeting and there was some profanity uh, during that meeting. And uh, the male actually said, uh, ladies, forgive me for what I'm about to say, and then continued um, with his profanity. And uh, so I actually uh, spoke to him afterwards and said, do you kind of realize that you've kind of called out there is a difference? So you've just apologized to, to ladies and you was gonna say it anyway. So you kind of caveated uh, ladies, close your ears kind of scenario and I'm sure we've all heard it. And when I spoke to him, uh, it was very much a, in, in his kind of, when he was growing up, it was never to offend a lady. And uh, so I said, well, actually, there may be some males in that same meeting that actually would also be offended by your profanity in that sense. And, uh, and so it was just starting to challenge those thoughts and, and just give people that um, kind of bit of insight as to have you thought about it, uh, with what your actions um, could be perceived both male and female. And I've actually, uh, and equally the other side of that, I've had um, kind of females that have, um, said that we can't, uh, so there was a, a male colleague who was quite emotional uh, over something and he was uh, quite challenging in terms of his behaviours in a previous company and making it very known that he was unhappy about something and, uh, and one of the female colleagues came to me and said I'm really, as, as a woman, I really don't want to see that behaviour. I said well actually that behaviour is not acceptable whether you're a woman or a male uh, there could be males that also uh, don't like that behaviour or feel um, uh, kind of that that aggression is absolutely not within uh, the workplace. So um, again, it's just challenging it, I think, from from both sides and, uh, and starting to kind of look at that bias. Great. OK, thank you. And uh, then Julia. Um, yeah, so, so I think on this one and it touches on a point that Erica made earlier around, you know, us as leaders female leaders I think I think absolutely we can affect the most change if we're leading the change um and you know so you know first of all lean in to take those leadership roles and then once we're into those leadership positions don't then become one of the leadership that isn't challenging norms you know once you get up there is actually challenge some of those behaviors that are sort of creating bias in the system that's preventing women uh, from progressing. And I, I can use an example of in one of my positions where uh, as a leader, everyone else uh, alongside me is male. Um, we start talking about part-time working or reduced hours and why women are not progressing. And you know their viewpoint is absolutely valid. It's their perspective, however, you know they're not coming from a position of actually no you're wrong there that's not how it is because I'm somebody who who's had to do that and therefore I think once we're up there as leaders we can challenge those norms and try and change for the better um, you know to support our colleagues and I think that's probably the second point is you know you you often hear this oh women are worse than you know the men when it comes to supporting women to progress and to promote and so we absolutely need to be supportive uh, and the way we can do that is to be a mentor share our experiences coach people you know and I think as Lisa said be that role model uh, that that you know our colleagues can look up to um, and then I think just one final point, um, and it comes back to this uh, sort of perception on microaggressions. I think we we all have slightly different uh, perceptions around this, and I've realised that I'm probably older generation. <laughs> um, some of those some of those microaggressions that are called out, I would look at it and say, "Oh, well, I didn't, I don't feel, I don't feel that as an aggression." However. 
some of my colleagues do feel that as an aggression. So I think we just need to be mindful and accepting that for some people that, that they feel it and others don't. But, you know, we need to recognize them and call them out, uh, like Lisa said. Yeah, I suppose that's a good sign in the change that's happened that yeah. uh, people are noticing those smaller things more. Great. Thank you, Julia and Erica. So, so I think we've come a long way, right, from the sort of overt sexism that we used to get around the boardroom table. You know, I clearly remember someone saying, about to say something sexist and went, Erica's not going to like this, but... And then I went, don't say it then. <laughs> um, uh, uh, um, no, but... Uh, no, no, please don't say it if you know I'm not going to like it. Um, so so I think we have. But, but where I think we can really make a difference is walking the walk as senior women. So... You know, I, when I first started at Mediacom, we had a couple of people who worked part time um, and then I worked part time hours and I was quite uh, over about that. You know, I'm going to pick up my kids, et cetera, et cetera. I'll be in late because I've got a meeting with the school. Um, and, and so w by the end of it, a real substantial number of our department were working part time. And someone, you know, who I wanted to take a job sort of said, well, I can't really because I've got young children and I've got childcare issues. And I said to them, well, what about if your husband drops a day a week and you drop a day a week? And then, you know, there's a sort of happy medium there. And, and they said, oh, I've never really thought about that. And I think that's quite a nice example where a person who wouldn't have applied for the job took the job. Um, it worked out really well and they're absolutely brilliant but also it benefited um, the, uh, the chap as well because he got to spend some time with his children too right um, and I think that makes a big difference and that's the thing about a lot of the stuff and I know there's a lot of talk about oh that's women's day when's men's day but a lot of the stuff that we are doing um, for, for, for gender equality is actually really benefiting um, the men as well because they're getting you know paternity leave more time with their children they're getting you, you know um more family time and stuff like that and i think that's really important so for me it's about encouraging people to apply for roles and looking at the flexibility that can be built in roles to adapt to people's circumstances that might be children it might be uh, caring for elderly relatives it might be travel it might be just even free time i had someone work for me who was a tennis pro and needed to do a couple of hours um training in the morning and and so there's lots of things like that 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 makes a real difference i think and that's that's the end of the scale where we can try and help people find workarounds to balance life and still get that career advancement that they need because when we look at women they start off uh, quite equal in terms of pay and, and, and in terms of senior levels and as we move towards the top we see that gap widen and I believe that gap is due to you know in part to flexible working people not going for roles because they don't think that it's doable with their personal circumstances and an unconscious bias and that type of stuff as well so I think we can all make a difference there as as senior leaders yeah that's great. And I think that point about, um, you know, opening up, if, it, if you can take away some of these stereotypes about who's meant to look after the children, like you say, you know, if you are with a partner, um, then it just frees the conversation up to who's best placed to do it. Like the, Julia, you were talking about the debate you had with your husband, you know, it frees it up to making the decision based on the whole picture. So that's, yeah. Yeah. That's and, and, and to come back to what Erica said, actually, you know, forcing him to get involved in drop offs or pickups um, because we have to split it. Someone can't do both and do their day's work is actually giving him an opportunity to spend more time with his children. And, and he actually used to love doing the drop off uh, in the end. So but if I hadn't pushed that point, um, you know, you wouldn't be able to, to manage, you know, on, on full time working. So I think that's important. Great. OK, so, Matt, do we have um, questions in the Q&A? We've had a few come in, Beth. Yes. Um, yeah. Should I start with the first one? Um, yeah. So I don't know who'd like to pick this up, but one of the first questions is, what are you asking of your team differently to support gender equality? So I don't know, Julia, Lisa, 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 Erica. Yeah, should we go to Lisa for that Lisa? one? Lisa? Yeah, I can pick that one up. Um, 
so for particularly for for my teams um and i have about i want to say about 250 uh, individuals within uh, within the finance organization within europe and uh, my ask of uh, of my team is really around um they can lead change they can be this champion um from whatever seat they are in or whatever role they are in uh, i use the term seat so it, for me, it's leading from every seat and whether that's a senior or a leadership team or whether that's uh, my teams that are out in the uh, out within the, uh, the organization. Everybody has that responsibility for equality. Um, we have uh, so we have within Jordan, we have our employee engagement uh, action plans. I, uh, I try to network in a virtual world as much as I can with with my teams in terms of kind of virtual coffee mornings and lunch and learn and just trying to build that relationship and that open culture and then on the the back of that I would like to uh, to start uh, using what I uh, what I call kind of reverse mentoring um, so again I still have a lot to learn and I like to to learn from uh, some more of my kind of junior uh, team particularly uh, around kind of what's working for them or, or where they need uh, kind of advice uh, and that, uh, and then it helps me learn about skill sets, and maybe they know about a new, um, a new app or a new tool that would help us be able to communicate better as an organisation. And I can get that input from them. Uh, but you need that kind of open environment, and, and, and so for me, being in my first year of, uh, of this role or just coming up to the first year anniversary, a lot of it was uh, obviously sowing the, the seed to be able to do that and that they know that there's no kind of uh, no hidden agenda and uh, for my team having that kind of self-fixing culture uh, is really important for me they don't they should hold each other accountable as their support network uh, they don't need me around to, to police it they should be uh, kind of self-fixing and and using uh, these uh, kind of the championing uh, the the equality side for me and for themselves. So holding each other accountable, really. Yeah. I've heard people talk about the reverse mentoring and trying to get it up and running. Is that is that a set program you have um, or is it ad hoc? Um, so yes, yeah, so I've, I've done it in a few companies uh, previously. It really depends um, usually on the uh, kind of the, the location of the person, whether I'm doing it kind of face to face or whether it is uh, virtual in terms of how you start to build that relationship. and. Um, it's often that I'll have a look at uh, particularly around a skill set that I think uh, that I need to learn about uh, and how do I find the right person to teach me within the, the kind of within the organization um, from from some more of my junior team so depend I kind of I suppose it's a bit more free-flowing and depends on what I would like to kind of learn from a skill set but also gives them an opportunity to give very much kind of open opinion of, of what's working so um, no kind of set uh, profile of setting that up um, but it's uh, it's something that I have found quite valuable in the past yeah that's great I bet they feel really good as well from going through that process so um, okay thank you so Erica would you like to answer this question as well yeah so I think I think there's a couple of things you know that that I like from my team I think the concept of reciprocity which is hard to say um, but it's very important. So I think a lot of businesses these days are quite focused on, you know, what they can get from their employers, what you're going to add to this role when they're interviewing them, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. And we have to look at that give and take aspect of things in terms of the flexible working, flexibility around school pickup, um, working from home, et cetera, et cetera. And then I think the other thing that, that we can do as senior leaders, which we don't necessarily um appreciate is we we have the chance to mentor and develop everyone in our teams and we don't necessarily realize that we're doing it on a daily basis but we are so I went to a uh, um, an event a, a good few years ago and I took a few colleagues uh, friends that I've met through the business and, and a couple of work colleagues from my team and uh, and they were talking about mentors and, and I remember saying, oh, I've not done any sort of mentoring, really. Maybe I should maybe I should do some of that. Um, and, and they turned around to me and, and my friend said, we, 
but you you do you're our mentor that there was that time I wasn't going to take that job because I thought it was too hard and you told me that I absolutely should take it and then someone else said yeah and there was that time as well and then you think actually you have a chance to um, encourage people to progress throughout their career even if it means taking someone to a meeting where they'll get exposure to stuff that they wouldn't necessarily necessarily get or giving them a special project to do that enables them to, to develop specific skills. We always need to be cognizant of the fact that as leaders, we've got a duty to develop our people and that we need to bear that in mind all the time, I think. And that, yeah. you know, loyalty also works two ways, not one as well. Yeah, and that's a good point. It can be quite an informal setup that you could, you know, you could offer that support. Okay, so we're, we're five minutes to go. The time really has rushed past. Um, but there, someone's just put a message in the um, question and answer. So, um, Louise has said, I'd like to make the point that economic inequality is often caused by women stepping back to have children, and never regaining their careers. Um, and I think that is, a, you know, a, a big challenge. Any, um, and, and, you know, she's not asking a question, it's sort of stating something, but any any comments on that from, uh, from yeah. the panellists? Yeah, I'd have one just to add on that. Um, <laughs> interestingly, when I was stepping back and I contracted, it was probably the most financially lucrative <laughs> time of my career, although obviously you don't quite have the security. But I, I do agree with the point, actually. But I think there's one other point that I've noticed uh, through my career. And uh, I used to manage quite a large diverse team I think it was pretty much 50 50 male female and every year at pay review time and performance award and you know this isn't a stereotype this is what happened you know I'd say you know 90% of the men would come in and say right I, I need a pay rise I, if you don't give me a pay rise I'm leaving and you know I'd be on the back foot then I knew what my budget was and then you know the women on the flip when I did give pay rise were like oh thank you so much not knowing their own worth so um and and I actually got uh, one of my exes to give me some tips on negotiation when I go in for my pay review uh, which I've never forgotten um and I do think uh, absolutely there is inherent bias and as leaders and uh, in businesses we should pay equally um but I do also think there's something that we can do as well which is negotiate and stand your ground on what you're worth and I think sometimes as women we don't always realize what we're worth um, and therefore we don't push it um, so I think I think we can take something from that as well uh, to try and push for what we what we deserve. That's a really good point and uh, someone else has commented saying they get annoyed when recruiters ask what I earn as I tend to earn less than my peers, I'm trying to break away from current worth. So yeah, that's um, that's a challenge. Actually, in the um, US, I found out that because um, we're part of a Robert Half's a you know, big US company, and we can no longer in the US ask people um, what they earn. It it doesn't matter. It's on the job. So they're trying to get away from those biases. Um, so to your point, Gay, that's um, you know who knows if that will will come, but that it's like it's irrelevant. If you're right for this job, then you'll be right for that job. So. OK, so um, two minutes to go. Um, so we'll uh, we'll wrap up now. But like I say, it's gone so quickly. Um, but the the final slide is is really a little uh, a little thing for our internal members. We've got many females on the call from who actually work for Robert Half. So just taking the opportunity to tell them that tomorrow marks the launch of uh, Robert Half Women's Employee Network, although it is open to men and women. And one of the goals of the community is to amplify women's perspectives and share ideas. And I think that is exactly what our panelists have done today. So it's been a really good way to launch our network. So thank you very much to you. And I'll wrap up by saying thank you to Matt for producing the webinar today. Very smooth process, apart from the momentary uh, disappearance of the slide deck, which we were anticipating. And then, um, Thank you to everyone who's turned up for the call and for attending. And you know, these are topics that uh, people have requested. So we're really glad that you've turned up and, um, and listened to them. And finally, thank you very, very much to Erica, Julia and Lisa for sharing some great stories and ideas and um, generally offering inspiration to other um, women who are looking to, de to, de uh, to develop their careers. So we really appreciate you taking the time to do this. So thank you all. and. Um, Goodbye.
Bye. Bye.